Hey, good morning, Mercy Church. Hey, next week, I want to start off just kind of making sure we're all aware. Next week is Serve Week for Mercy Church. Kicks off on March 10th, going through the 17th. We are so excited about it. If if you're kind of newer to, to Mercy Church, think of Serve Week like a, um, like a, a mission trip, a church-wide mission trip to our city, all right? So what we do is um, we basically join up with a few um, ministry partners. These are ministry partners that Mercy members have been serving with year-round, and we take Serve Week, and we just kind of ramp up the work that we've been doing with those ministry partners. And it gives us a chance to also help you if you haven't been serving anywhere in our community. It's a very easy opportunity for you to take a step into um, seeing what it looks like to serve with your time, to serve people in need in our community. Um, It's gonna be a good week and we have tried to make it as um, easy as possible for you to take that step, all right? So immediately after uh, this worship service, there's gonna be a spot where you can go and just hear what it is that we're doing, who are the different ministry partners we're serving with, and you, can, um, and you can find one that you can join up with. Now, we ask, hey, maybe take a work day, maybe take a half day. If you can't take time, take uh, an evening, or if nothing else, next Saturday, March, uh, the, I think it'd be the 16th, um, take that time, and just sacrifice your time for the sake of serving others. That's what the church is called to do, and do it alongside some other mercy folks, and um, I think it'll be something that will not only be fun, but I think it'll just be, again, and an entry point into um, experiencing the joy of Christ when we're serving others, all right? So you join us for that. Uh, that'll be great. One cool thing we're doing, one of our um, ministry partners is actually a school that we've developed a great relationship with, Eastway Middle School. And so to kind of um, have some fun with and really is a cool way to celebrate Serve Week, what we're gonna do is on the bookends of Serve Week, March 10th and 17th, so next Sunday uh, and the 17th, our Independence Campus is going to actually move its worship services over to Eastway uh, Middle School. For That's gonna be an awesome time. We're gonna have a lot of fun. Providence Road, you'll still be at Providence Road. Independence will be over there um, at Eastway Middle. It's gonna be a great time to celebrate what the Lord has been doing in that relationship uh, for some time now. So I'm excited about that and wanna put that on your radar. With that said, uh, we gotta jump in. We got some work to do. We are in the last week of our Daniel series. So if you got your Bible, go ahead and open that up to Daniel chapter seven. Uh, Man, this has been a fun, fun series uh, for me. I've heard a lot of of good response for you as well from you. Uh, This book follows Daniel and his friends as they try to figure out what does it look like to follow God, to obey God and be submitted to God inside of a culture that doesn't follow God, that isn't submitted to God which is what's made it so good for us because that's the context that we find ourselves in as Christians in the 21st century, right? Trying to figure out how to follow God when everybody around us doesn't necessarily follow God, right? And so it has been really good for us. I feel like there's been a couple of things that have come out. The first is Daniel and his friends have been a great model for us, right? Of what it looks like to try and obey God and to be submitted to him inside of a world that, that isn't. And that's been good for us, but... Daniel also serves a deeper purpose and one that I think uh, between the two, we really have to grab hold of. The second thing is that it serves as kind of like a a giant billboard pointing us to our need for God. Does that make sense? Because when, here's what happens. Daniel is the role model for us. So then we go and we measure ourselves up against Daniel and we fall short. Because none of us are as holy as Daniel, right? And, And listen, The author and then God himself designed Daniel, the book of Daniel, to be read that way, to where we get inspired by Daniel, but then we find ourselves falling short of being as strong in the faith as Daniel, right? And so what Daniel does that shows us we need someone to be Daniel for us. That's that's the second half of, of what it's doing. The Daniel billboard, the Daniel sign is saying, hey, you need to look at Jesus, the one who was even greater than Daniel, the one who lived fully surrendered to God, who actually did live the perfect life. And then according to the gospels, here's what happened. According to the gospels, this Jesus gave us who have fallen short, who couldn't live up to Daniel, who couldn't live up to perfection. This Jesus gave us his clean record and then took our guilty record, our record of sins where we have fallen short. He took it on himself. And that's kind of the, the hope of the gospel is that this is, this is what Christ has done for us. And so now we can stand before God because our record is clean. 
Y'all, Daniel, and one of the things that the sermons last week majored on, Daniel's about Jesus. So Daniel inspires us to exercise greater faith, but then it comes along and it comforts us and says, when you fall short, actually, it's especially when you fall short and you will, you can experience, you can lean into the great love of God for you. That's the, the joy of Daniel. That's where we've been. And, and all of that has been a setup for today. Today is this wonderful, super hype finish to the book of Daniel, to the Daniel series, at least. In Daniel 7, um, Daniel 7 is all about hope, all about hope. In fact, the message today is the core message of hope that Christianity is built on. Christianity is a hope-oriented, hope-founded, hope-infused belief system. It's all about hope. I want you to think about it this way. All, just go with me, turn your brains on for a second, okay? If they're not on, lock in. All of our present hope that we have, all of that is supplied by, it's created by a confidence we have in a future victory, okay? Does that make sense? So the the future circumstances, we have confidence that they're going to work out well. And because we have confidence of what's gonna happen in the future, that creates joy and optimism. It creates hope in our present circumstances, all right? That, and the more confidence we have in what's going to happen in the future, the more hope we have in the present. All right, I, I'll think about it this way. If you, a little example might help you out. Um, my dad is Don Shelton, okay? Don Shelton went to UNC Chapel Hill. He Woo! loves the Tar Heels, all right? It's March Madness now, so maybe this, this is just a good timely illustration, all right? So dad raised his firstborn son, Spence Shelton, raised, born and bred Tar Heel, okay? I had the chance to go to UNC, and so it is, it is locked in in me when I die. I'm a Tar Heel dad, all right? That's the alma mater. That's me. Now, here's the thing. Don Shelton's also a CPA, and if any of you are CPAs or in the accounting world, you know that um, January to April 15th is called tax season, which is also where March Madness is. That's like already the most stressful time of the year. And so dad gets super into college basketball and it's like, he can't handle the stress of of UNC Tar Heel basketball in addition to the stress of accounting season, all right, and tax season. So what what he's done for his own health and sanity is um, he will record the Carolina basketball games and then he will find out, he doesn't record them so that, um, you know, I couldn't watch it right now, so don't tell me the score and then I'll go back and watch it later. No, no, he records it And then he goes and he finds out who won. And if Carolina won, then he watches the game. He has to know that it's going to turn out okay before he subjects himself to all the drama, right? Because he needs to know that if they get down by eight in the second half against Clemson, yesterday, that they're going to be able to pull it out in the end. And if if he knows in advance that they're gonna win, then he can go, man, I don't know how in the world they're gonna get out of this mess, right? But I know what the final score is, so I know it's gonna be okay. That is Daniel 7 today, all right? Future um, circumstances, confidence in future victory is supplying hope in the present. When I know how it's gonna end, my whole perspective changes. Present hope supplied by confidence, future victory. God knows Daniel's in a hard time. Right, He and his friends are on their own inside of a land that doesn't know, is not submitted to God, and God supplies to Daniel a vision of how everything is gonna play out, of what's gonna happen at the end of days. And this has been put down in the Bible for us too, to let us see what is going to happen at the end of days and for that certainty of what's gonna happen in the future to supply us with the hope that will strengthen us for the present. We get to look into the victory God has promised to ultimately deliver against evil. We get to see it. Here's our main idea today, all right? The gospel offers powerful hope today because it promises eternal victory. That's where the hope comes from is the promise of eternal victory. I want you to walk away today. This is our kind of the big objective is to walk away very clear on the victory extended out to you through Jesus. This may be the clearest place in scripture where Jesus' ultimate victory over all things at the end of days, his ultimate victory, this might be the clearest place where it's described. In fact, 
Jesus quotes Daniel 7 more than anything else when he talks about who he is. You're gonna see that come up. And listen, church, we are a people of hope. We come in here and we celebrate that Jesus rose, but we also celebrate that he reigns in victory forever and we get to share in that victory. Do you understand that's what's happening every time we get in here? It is a celebration of what Christ did and it is an anticipation of what he's gonna do. And y'all, life isn't easy. You know this. Some of y'all came in here on a, off of a hard week and there are plenty of uncertainties in your life that are producing fear, which is why God gave us one another in the church so that we could have at least one time a week where our hearts are recalibrated back onto a certain victory that will create hope, that will be able to push out and overwhelm that fear. And in the end, in the end, hope wins over fear. I'm, I am like giving y'all the whole sermon and I gotta track it back and let's get into the text. I'm gonna show you, okay? Um, listen, last uh, kind of word on this. Um, of, of preface, Daniel is structured like the whole book is structured where the first um, six chapters are historical narrative. That's what we've been walking through, right? They're events that were unfolding and we're watching those events unfold. And then the back half of the book is a series of visions that Daniel had while he was living through the events uh, that were unfolding, all right? The visions are about the end times and they're awesome, I'm giving you one of those today. I love this stuff. We're gonna spend more time on it in the future, uh, but today I'm giving you the big one from Daniel and probably my favorite one, uh, to be honest. I mean, y'all listen, there are beasts with horns. There are chariots and rivers of fire. There is a battle for thrones. I, I love this stuff. And I probably need to say to you, uh, at this moment, if you're not familiar uh, with this part, this kind of like uh, area of the Bible, or maybe you're skeptical about this kind of writing, all it takes is a little bit of time um, studying it and some really clear, some really hope-filled truths start to rise up out of it. And y'all, this is the Bible. All of it is God's word and it's all good for us according to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It's useful right, for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And we believe this is as well. And the more we get into it, the more I'm like, man, you can't walk through life without the hope that is there in Daniel 7. All right, God gave this to us for our good. I think you're gonna see that today. So let's go into it and see what he has for us. We're gonna read the first eight verses all together. One section, I'm gonna read it. Okay, you don't have to like try and follow, you know. You read it um, as I read it aloud to you. This is gonna show us, these first eight, what we have victory over. All right, here we go. In the first year of King Belshazzar of Babylon, you remember him from chapters four or five, like when he started to come around, right? Um, Daniel had a dream with visions in his mind as he was lying in his bed. He wrote down the dream, and here's the summary of his account. Daniel said, in my vision at night, I was watching, and suddenly the four winds of heaven stirred up the great sea. Four huge beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion, but had eagle's wings. I continued watching until its wings were torn off. It was lifted up from the ground, set on its feet like a man, and given a human mind. Suddenly another beast appeared, a second one that looked like a bear. It was raised up on one side with three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and it was told, get up, gorge yourself on flesh. After this, while I was watching, suddenly another beast appeared. It was like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. It had four heads and it was given dominion. After this, while I was watching in the night vision, suddenly a fourth beast appeared, frightening and dreadful and incredibly strong with large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and it trampled with its feet whatever was left. It was different from all the beasts before it and it had 10 horns. While I was considering the horns, suddenly another horn, a little one, came up among them, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it, and suddenly in this horn, there were eyes like the eyes of a human and a mouth that was speaking arrogantly. <laughs> Y'all, the Bible, Bible, it is wild, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, I know if you're newer to the Bible, you're like, how am I supposed to apply this tomorrow morning at work? <laughs> right, like, 
I, my boss seems like he has four heads sometimes, or I don't know, like, how does this work? Look, in fact, what I'm gonna show you today is it is incredibly applicable. I'm telling you, what we are seeing here is how the game ends. And if you jump down a few verses, you get Daniel's um, very sensible, it's like the so common sense reaction to what we just read, and actually some more stuff too. Uh, and it helps us with the first eight verses. Look at verse 15. As for me, Daniel, my spirit was deeply distressed within me, and the visions in my mind terrified me. Like, thank you, Daniel, because we're all feeling that a little bit. And so I approached one of those who was standing by and asked him to clarify all this. He's in the vision, see somebody, he's like, hey man, what's going on, right? And so he let me know the interpretation of these things. And for the first eight verses, verse 17 helps. These huge beasts, four in number, are four kings who will rise from the earth. So then the, the natural response to that is, all right, um, who are the four kings? Now, let me take you down a little aside that's helpful in grabbing hold of what's happening in this, okay? Different people view this differently. They're kind of two main schools of thought. Most generally agree that what's happening here is similar to the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had back in chapter two. If you weren't here with us for that, you can go back and listen to that podcast. But there's a, basically a vision where each um, kingdom, one kingdom would rule after the other, and each kingdom would be more violent and more beastly than its predecessor. So the lion of our vision here in Daniel 7 would be Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar. He started off like a wild tyrant, but then he was humbled and he became sane in his mind and, and devoted himself to the Lord. This would be like him being given a human mind. It was sane. The bear would be the Persian empire that took out Babylon. But from there, well, it just kind of starts to get into speculation because you're going beyond Daniel's life. Some historians say that the leopard is Greece and then Alex, with Alexander the Great, and then the fourth is Rome. But then there are others that say, no, the bear is actually uh, the Medo Empire that was very brief. Then uh, the leopard was the Persians, and then the fourth was um, Greece. You know, I think you could go either way on that. There's some sense in it, but I don't think that that's the point. And I don't think we should label uh, these empires, especially we shouldn't identify the fourth beast with some kind of certain geopolitical nation state or something like that, because this beast isn't like anything, right? The others say it's like a lion, like a bear, like a leopard, but this one's just a beast. Its ruthlessness is like nothing the world has ever seen. And it gets a lot of attention in the back half of the chapter. We'll come back to it. But I wanna, I wanna show you what I think the author wants us to see in these first eight verses. The author wants to make an impression on us. God wants to make an impression on us. He wants us to feel a sense of terror and horror as we look at these beasts that have come up out of the sea and are trampling over all of mankind. The image particularly of the bear with the, the ribs and its teeth, gorging flesh, it's gruesome, it's horrific. And what the author is saying is this is what happens with each new kingdom. It may promise peace, but it will not deliver. Kingdoms will continue to rise and fall, and they will rise and fall through war and death. Daniel's saying there's no kingdom of this earth that's gonna bring everlasting peace to the world. And the overwhelming testimony of human history is that any time humans start to build a kingdom, it comes at the cost of blood. Right, I mean, the last 100 years, there are so many examples, I'm not even gonna take time to list them all out. Civilization, to, to cut it short and summarize, civilization has not gotten more civilized. And the point is, don't be naive about our humanity. Regime change, even ones that feel like, oh, now there's real progress, cannot cure the problem at the core of the human heart. And you and I feel this. Right, the more, try, the more we try to control uh, our lives, the more we try to control the people in our lives, the circumstances, the outcomes, the more we then live in fear, anxiety, and anger. The more those things start to control us, even though we're trying to control our lives. It's not just a personal thing though. Daniel's saying no political ideology, no kingdom can provide hope because the more mankind tries to grab hold of power, the more beastly we start to act. Uh, the old uh, 
saying by the British Lord, Lord Acton. He said, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's what Daniel one through, uh, verses one through eight of Daniel seven are showing us. He's showing us that there is no one who's gonna rise up out of the earth, who's going to rid the earth of bloodthirsty evil. Evil is real, it is dark, it is beastly, and no kingdom or power from this earth will be able to stop it. That's bleak. It's real bleak. Uh, my son came to me the other night, one of my sons, and he said uh, he was having, um, or actually it was the next day, he said he had a nightmare the night before, and it woke him up, he was really scared. I said, okay, buddy, um, and this was this, this week, and um, I said, well, hey, man, let me read you something even scarier, right? So pull him aside, and I read him Daniel, one, uh, Daniel 7, 1 through 8. He's like, whoa. I said, but it doesn't end there. And what I'm about to show you, I told him, I said, now I want you to read the next few verses together because it changes everything. And what, what you think is a nightmare ends up being a beautiful victory and celebration. All right, that's what's happening right here. Into that bleak picture, a big scene shift comes. So let me go a little, little slower, just verses nine and 10. Watch this. As I kept watching, thrones, plural, were set in place, and the ancient of days took his seat. His clothing was white like snow, the hair of his head like white as wool. His throne was flaming fire. Its wheels were blazing fire. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from his presence. Thousands upon thousands served him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was convened and the books were opened. Y'all, Daniel's vision moves to these thrones. Again, like I said, plural. It's gonna be important in a minute. Uh, that are set in place, and the Ancient of Days takes his seat. The Ancient of Days uh, is, is God. That's very clear throughout Scripture. That is who this is that is sitting down. It, it's God himself. It's not that he's old. It's that he has always been. That's God. Here's what we're supposed to see from this. We're supposed to see order overtaking chaos. The beasts, they create chaos and destruction, but the Ancient of Days, he calmly steps in and he sits down. We're supposed to see fury against sin. That's what the fire is. Everywhere God's presence shows up in the Old Testament, there is fire, right? It's just a, but look, the fire's not out of control. It's controlled, right? It's the fire of justice against sin. That's why the court is convened and the books are opened. This is a courtroom session we're now in and the evil beast is about to be judged. And we should see majesty, listen to me, majesty outshining terror. 10,000 times 10,000, that's not a fancy way of saying 100,000, okay? It's an artistic way of saying there is a vast sea of people who acknowledge and are standing there with full, just full hearts worshiping and acknowledging who the one true God is. They aren't being trampled like they were under the beast. They're worshiping. You see the difference between the two. So I was telling my son, I was like, the, the beauty of this, bud, is that this is not just a, a dream. This is what's going to happen. Yeah. Let, and let me ask you something. As you see the difference between the, the, just the order and the, the majesty of God and the, the uh, terror of the beast, you look at the ancient of days, is this the God that you pray to? This wrecked me this week. And actually, the past couple of weeks leading up to, to preparing this, when you find space to sit down, I encourage you to, as often as you can, sit down with the Lord, uh, spend time with him. But when you do, when, when you're over uh, on your couch or at your ki kitchen table, who do you envision you're praying to? Is it the ancient of days? Y'all, wherever you are in your house or coffee shop, whatever that looks like, we should envision ourselves in a giant throne room where the one on the throne is so holy, so majestic, so powerful that we couldn't even touch him on our own because his fire would consume us. Is that your God? Because we were talking a minute about how you can approach that holy one. But is he that holy, that majestic, that awesome, to use the proper sense of the word, that awesome in your eyes? Now, we go into verse 11. Let me show you the final score. Let me show you how it ends. The reason we have hope. Verse 11, I watched. Then, because of the sound of the arrogant words, the horn was speaking. 
born of the beast. As I continued watching, the beast was killed, its body destroyed, and given over to the burning fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was removed, but an extension of life was granted to them for a certain period of time. Well, do you see how simple that was? How simple that victory was, the ease of it? In fact, we, we read on, it wasn't even a battle. The setting's not a battlefield, it's a courtroom. The victory is swift and decisive and as simple as a judge dropping the gavel. And what you have to see here is there is no challenging the authority of God. Whoever this fourth beast is, it is humanity's greatest threat of all time. And it is simply and permanently just dismissed. Just like that by the ancient of days. And then watch what happens next. One more shift in the scene. I continued watching in the night visions and suddenly one like a son of man was coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was escorted before him and he was given dominion and glory and a kingdom so that those of every people, nation and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. That's it. See, remember what how I said thrones, plural, was gonna be important? They were put in place. This image is telling you, here is one who looks human like a son of man, but he doesn't come from the earth like the beasts did. He comes from the clouds of heaven, yet has the appearance of a human, and he is in, escorted in front of the Ancient of Days, and he is given dominion over everything. See, what's happening, the one like the son of man is sitting down on the throne, taking his seat, and this right here, this scene, this is the spot Jesus kept coming back to when describing who he was. So that you may know, Matthew 9, 6, that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He told the paralytic, get up, take your stretcher and go home. And the paralytic rises up and walks. Mark 14, the high priest is questioning him. Are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? I am, said Jesus, and you will see who? The son of man, seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. I could go on and on, Matthew 8, Matthew 11, Matthew 16, Matthew 18, Matthew 20, Matthew 24, Mark 8, Luke 18, John 1, John 5, John 6, John 12, John 13. He just keeps going on about who he is. This is his identity. Why was Jesus so insistent on referring to himself as the son of man? He was telling us the final score of the game because he knew, he knew there were gonna be some moments, some tough moments. And so he said, I've told you these things so that in me you can have peace. You'll have suffering in this world, but be courageous. I have conquered the world, he says in John 16. Y'all, the early church grabbed onto this hope. You see it in the letters to the New Testament. Y'all, their eyes and their hearts were just fixed on heaven. And their courage, oh, you read, you read Hebrews. You read the, the hall of faith, their courage, to give their lives away day after day for the benefit of others. Their courage in the midst of persecution. Their courage to go and be sawn in two and to do so with joy. Where does that hope come from? They knew the final score. They knew how it was gonna end and they took that from that and they drew joy to get them through the present. They were a people of immense hope and joy and they changed the world. And that's what I wanna be a part of. Yeah, that's right. I wanna be one who believes that his God is the ancient of days, that his savior has won the victory and that the end of my story is standing in his glorious kingdom around the throne, <laughs> worshiping the ancient of days where there's no pain, Revelation 21, there are no tears, there is just celebration. That's what we get to be a part of. Let me put some handles on this for you. Let me put try. I really, I just want you to worship. I really just want you to lose yourself a little bit in the majesty and goodness of God that he has invited you into, into this celebration at the end of days. But let me give you some, some handles on how, maybe how you get there. What hope does the Son of Man offer you today? I've got four of them. There are so many more. I have four that I'll, I'll tell you first. Listen to me. The son of man can set you permanently free from your sin. 
permanently. Jesus sets captives free. That's what he does. I, I talked to, I, just, I guess this was the Lord's timing on this morning, multiple people um, this past week who shared stories of seeing Jesus set them free or someone they know set them free from substance addiction. Uh, one was alcohol, another was, was pills. And maybe your sin is an addiction like that. All sin is us trying to control our lives and trying to do things our way instead of God's way. And the Bible says we are enslaved to our sin. And some of y'all are feeling that this morning. You, that resonates with you. We think we control our lives. We think we control our problem, but our problem actually ends up controlling us. And Jesus speaks into that in Luke 4. Listen to what he says. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Some of y'all need freedom today. And the promise to you is you will never win this battle on your own. You can't. The beast is too strong. That's the picture of Daniel 7, trampling over all of humanity. But what you get to see today is Christ showing you the score has gone final. Jesus has won the victory. He will defeat Satan. He will crush evil. He will reign forever. And that power the power that just dismisses Satan at the end, it's at work here and now. One person at a time, you can have it today. He says, repent and believe. He will forgive you and you can be free, free today from the power that sin has over you. That bottle that you keep going to, you can finally be free from it. The body image that you are enslaved to I have to look a certain way in order to be accepted. No, 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 no. Christ says, he looks at you and he says, I created you. I love you. And you are complete and you are perfect because of me and what I say over you. And you can be free, free from being enslaved to that. For those of you that are career, that you're, you're career obsessed. And I have to keep climbing, uh, keep climbing. Right? I have to keep improving. So your mind is always working. It's always on. Christ comes in and says, no, that will never satisfy you. You can't see it right now because everybody around you is celebrating how hard you're working, but you're enslaved to it. And it will ne never satisfy that need that you have to be accepted and approved of and loved. And Christ speaks into that. And he says, you can be free. You can be free from that and have victory today because I love you. And my, what my words spoken over you are the only words that matter. You can be free. Here's the second thing I want you to see. Oh, there's so many. There's so many, but here's, here's the next one. The son of man will bring all those who believe in him into eternity with him. I told you Christianity is this hope. It's just a hope-based faith system. The New Testament writers, they are, they're just heaven-oriented, heaven-fueled, heaven-motivated writers. They believe that in the end, Jesus wins, and we who believe uh, what he's done, we share in that victory. And so we spend eternity with him, and y'all, eternity, according to scripture, is rich. I mean, you read the last two chapters of the Bible. You better believe the New Testament authors were clinging to the hope that's described there. A beautiful city, unlike anything you can imagine. Delicious food straight from the tree of life. Perfect peace, perfect celebration and joy with others. Heaven is described as a wedding feast. And I want you to understand that the promise of heaven, it's only in Christ. Scripture's clear on that. He's abundantly clear. John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. But this victory is the victory our faith is built on. So do you believe this? Because every faith system has an answer to the question, what happens when you die? Most of them say, you will get what you deserve. They either say that or they'll say nothing. Either it's just oblivion and it's over or you get what you deserve. Christianity says, if you surrender to Christ, you get to share in his victory. In short, you get something far better than you deserve. But make no mistake, there's no hope of heaven apart from him. He makes that clear. And today, 
Some of you need to be set free from sin. You need to fix your eyes on heaven and realize the only way there is through Christ. You need to surrender your life to him and find salvation from your sin in him today. And he is ready for you. Here's the next one. Our future victory supplies us with joy, listen to me, in present suffering. The tone of the New Testament, it's joyful anticipation of heaven because life was hard and life is hard for some of us. In fact, eventually life's hard for all of us. But listen, here's the hope of, of heaven in the New Testament. It says it this way, we will see Jesus. We'll see him. First Corinthians 13, Revelation 22, talks about entering heaven and seeing him face to face. And that moment is so powerful, so great, so good, that scripture goes so far to say present suffering, which is real. Present suffering is not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us, to that moment where we see Jesus face to face. That should not, you shouldn't hear that and say that the Bible's trying to minimize your suffering. It's trying to exalt and maximize the greatness of God in your eyes. It's so powerful. And this hope has sustained. This is the hope, y'all. This is what has sustained believers for 2,000 years. Romans 8, 18, I consider present sufferings of this time not worth comparing with the glory to be revealed in us. This is one of the reasons why the book of Daniel is still to this day so treasured by the persecuted church because they're not winning a military victory in this life. They're not getting tax breaks for tithing. They're poor, they're oppressed, they're wrongly accused and they're imprisoned and yet they're filled with joy. Why? They're living in victory. They have victory over their sins. They're new people and they're clinging to the hope, future confidence and future victory giving them present hope because one day they'll reign with Jesus in heaven. So they say with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, my God is powerful enough that he can save me from this fire. But even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't, it's better for me to worship him than to worship anyone else. And one day I'll be with him. And Revelation 21 tells me he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more. Listen, don't just let this be words. This is God's word spoken over you. This is certain victory that needs to supply present hope in your soul. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. Here's the last thing. In just a moment. Our future victory informs and empowers our present purpose. One of the things I really, really want you to leave Daniel with is a clear sense of direction for your life. That might be a bold, big thing to say, but y'all, we need to be a people of purpose. See, when Jesus left, he told his disciples, go spread the good news, that he's the son of man, that people can have forgiveness from sin and freedom, forgiveness for sin and freedom from sin through him. And so then the disciples respond by asking about Daniel 7 stuff. Are you restoring the kingdom now? He says, don't worry about that. Acts 1.8, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you. And you'll be, this is your job. Don't worry about what happens at the end of days. That's for me. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Their job was to witness what they'd seen. That's courtroom language. And that's our job today. But we don't do it on our own. Acts 1.8. The power of the Holy Spirit comes upon us. That's what happens when we give our lives to Christ. When we believe that he died, rose again, we receive his forgiveness. He brings his spirit into our lives and the spirit empowers us for the purpose God has for us. That's where the power for our calling comes from. Listen, you ever, um, you ever seen someone have like an odd reaction to a situation, like a different one than you would have and your response is, man, you must know something I don't know. That's what I want Charlotte to say about the people of Mercy Church. Man, you guys are so joyful, so generous with your money, so self-sacrificing. You must know something we don't. We do. It's not something, it's someone. His name is Jesus. Let me tell you about him. How he saved me and how he won a victory for me that I never deserved. And how that future victory is supplying present hope that you can get in on. Y'all, we're gonna take communion together. So we're gonna close down um, this, I say close down, actually, let me rephrase that. That's what we're gonna continue 
responding, continue celebrating the victory we have in Christ. Our, our band is gonna come. They're gonna get in place for us to do that. Listen, this is gonna be where believers, they're gonna take these elements in response um, to what God has done for us. And you who are not Christians, we want you to consider this gospel message and today give your life to them. Let me give you just a brief moment to respond though before um, the elements are passed by, okay? So if you would, bow your head and close your eyes and, and pray, with, um, pray with me. If you are not a Christian, your response today is simply, it's simply and only God, today I'm turning from my sin, today. Today I'm choosing to believe that you died for my sin. I get your record, you take my record. I believe you died for my sin. I believe you give me forgiveness for my sin. And I believe because you got out of the grave, you defeated death. And I get to be with you in victory in heaven for all eternity. I believe that today. You say, God, I believe that today. I give you my life today. Christian, as you're sitting there praying, celebrate. Thank him for his goodness. Take yourself to the throne room and celebrate the Ancient of Days. Worship him. A foretaste of heaven. God, we worship you. We praise you. God, might our, our praises, our songs be worthy of the Ancient of Days, who we get to actually stand with because of what Christ has done. Thank you for the victory we have in Christ. We worship you, Father, in his name. Amen. <laughs>